So now we are recording. So what makes the tutor very fascinating to me overall is the idea that we go from even, you know, even farther from the Renaissance and the idea of utilitarian garments, this idea of clothing to cover our body to satisfy more of the what's than the why's. And we really start to see it evolve into a much larger idea of capital F fashion. So when we're looking at this period, we're ultimately looking at the impact that the royalty, the wealthy had on garments, on silhouette, on size, on shape, and how that then sort of starts to move down to, I guess, I guess you could say in the lower classes. You know, when we talk about like the 1980s, we talk a lot in fashion about this idea of trickle down. You know, these things start with these haute couture designers and we'll talk about the idea of haute couture and what that means. Um, I think next time we talk about it, but this idea of these designers who are creatives and individuals and they're trying to put forward this idea of what is fashion. And we all look at it, we're like, nobody's gonna wear this. And then eventually it finds its way down mm -hmm. to the next group, bits and pieces of it, and then another group and bits and pieces. And slowly it works its way down to, you know, how we understand it, Old, old Navy, right? The things that, that were there, well, now it's like every 15 minutes, it seems, but the things that were, that seemed ridiculous, slowly find their way to common man. And we see that kind of in this period as well, because we have to be um, incredibly, well, hello, uh, <laughs> incredibly aware of one person, Henry VIII, because he, in a sense, because of who he is, because of the power that he has, because of the sort of excitement and gossip that surrounds him, he becomes a very important figure, not just in England, but kind of throughout the whole world. And because of the way that he is, because of his, we're gonna use the word misogyny very carefully, we see women form in a way and we see men's clothes form in a way. That, that, that sort of changes up the idea of silhouette, texture, and form. Now, um, the first thing I wanna talk about, and hopefully you can see the board pretty well, we're gonna, there's nothing on it now, so don't panic. But I do wanna talk about this idea of silhouette. So I'm gonna move her here, hello. And move him here. Hopefully they're just flanking. Okay, so when we were in the Italian Renaissance, most of our lines followed the body to some degree. Was there shaping? Well, it's not quite as, maybe look better on the but, but it tended to follow a much more lyrical quality of the body, even though we had volume, even though we had some abstraction of the silhouette, ultimately, sorry, I got to turn somebody off because they're, there we go. Um, it, it still tended to look at the body as the guidepost for how clothes went on. Even if they had extravagance, it tended to be in smaller pieces than the large vision, the large silhouette. And our silhouette moves from a very lyrical silhouette of the Italian Renaissance into a much more geometric silhouette. And so that shaping that we saw in Italy for say the men where, well, that's a lot of hip on one side, sorry about that, where it was really focused on the torso being one part and then the legs being unto themselves, what we really look at now is volume, volume, volume. So that in a sense, our silhouette becomes a box on two sticks, almost. 
And part of that is because as Henry grows, and we're gonna see some evolution of Henry, because he is such a larger man. And I mean, he was a big guy. It just wasn't that he was uh, gluttonous and greedy and just ate, ate, ate and became big that way. I mean, he, for his world, he was pretty big. I think he was thought to be about 6'2", maybe 6'3", which for us is, is pretty common, but for them, not so common. So big guy to begin with, and then he started to fill out. And that is actually going to have an impact on how we look at the entirety of the silhouette. Because the last thing, the potentially most important person in the world at that time is going to want to do is show himself in sort of a, a, a poor shape. So there, he's using clothing, he's using fashion. And what is fashionable, say, from Italy or even moving from the Gothic era, taking bits and pieces of all these things to come up with a silhouette in a shape that seems to satisfy him the most. Now, when we looked at women, so we get this idea of this big square, right? Sorry, got to move the, the chat just a little closer so I can see some of it. Um, you know, so we have this big square with then these two legs. For women, we see that silhouette, which again, felt somewhat lyrical with, some roundness and some fullness. And even in that Italian Renaissance form with that higher line or the Gothic with the higher line, we kind of take the angles of the Gothic. So if we, you know, we really wanna think about triangles and squares and shapes like that, and we sort of get rid of all of the, the roundness of the human body. Again, remember Italian Renaissance tended to be focused on the natural shapes of humans and really removes everything to create a triangle and a triangle. That we're really creating a silhouette that is as sort of uh, geometric as possible. Now, those of us who have bodies understand some of the challenges with this because we know, especially for women, we do have chest that can get in the way. And so we start this process of using things like stay to mold the body into a fashionable silhouette. Now, there are lots of challenges when we talk about support garments. And again, remember support garments are things that sort of fill in this area and structure are things that fill in that area. So support is through, sort of through the bodice and structure is sort of through the skirt area. Um, but we have this idea that, uh, that controlling the body through a stay or even in a sense through a corset was intended to, to manipulate and mutilate the body. And in some ways that's not quite true. What it was doing in a lot of cases is taking the softer, fleshier areas of the torso and carefully, in some cases, moving them in and around to help create the silhouette. Now in this period especially, and even in the next period, we do see a great deal of, I keep putting my hands here, which is really awkward as I see it in front of myself right here, but, but the, the chest area, the breast, do get, I guess you could say, pushed into the body to some degree. Now, when we, you know, you go to King Richard's Fair or you watch that silly TV show, Rain, or that other silly TV show, what's the one about King Henry? Um, oh gosh, what was the one? It was on Showtime. Tudors? What was it called? Wasn't it the Tudors? Oh. Tudors, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, the Tudors. Thank you so much. I, can, I guess because I hear Tudor and I think history, and then I think of the TV show, and there's almost no history there. But really, what those shows are doing is they're kind of making it a much more not historical romantic, but a much more sexy, sexy version of what it is. If you go to King Richard's Fair, perhaps. I always talk about this idea of the, the, um, the beer wenches, right? Where they're 
their corsetry or their support systems have shaped their body so much that their breasts sort of sit up here. And that's not the idea of what we're really going for. We're really trying to put the body into a position to allow it to be as triangular as possible. And so, again, that idea of the stay becomes incredibly important. So we're gonna look at it on the dress form as we get there, but this is, in a sense, the sort of shape that we would see in a stay. Notice how it's very conical. I'm trying to make sure we can sort of see the big picture. There's a strap, there's a strap. But its intention is to shape the body into as much of a cone as possible. And what that does is it takes the breasts, as I said, and sort of either pushes them slightly to the side or pushes them flat, not up, not down, but sort of puts them more flat. And so you can see how that would adjust the body. And as I talked about in last class, the idea of this stay is primarily a semi-circle or an arc. And so what that does naturally is it does have a little bit of give in it. I hasten to use the word stretch, but it has some give that then helps push and mold the body without being incredibly rigid. Now, as you can see, this garment here has some, what we would call boning in it. And what is the idea of boning? Boning is something that makes it rigid, but it isn't the same boning that we're gonna see in say 18th century stay. It's really just enough to hold the body into place. But the one piece that's incredibly important is this center section right here. Can you see how the center of this is by itself pretty rigid, pretty, um, it has you know, a great deal of stiffness right down the center. And that is the idea of the busk. And I mentioned the busk before. It's a piece of wood or such that would be slipped into the stay to keep that front very, very um, flat. And we can also see, as we see in this, it's, it has, trying to do this so I can, on camera. I'm not used to a one camera setup here, folks. Uh, usually I'm playing to the entire room and, and such, but can you see how the front of this stay goes lower than the waistline? So we see where that waistline is and we can see a little bit of a dip. And that's what we call the basque, B-A-S-Q-U-E. Um, and what that, the intention of that to, is in say a stay or such is to sort of press flat the tummy or this, the, the problem areas sometimes that we have. I think some people refer to it as the muffin top perhaps, um, to press that down, to keep that nice and smooth. And then we see, as we will see, sorry, wrong way, as we will see in these garments, it does become a shape that we, we sometimes see bodices form, which help create even more so this triangle silhouette. Now, the other thing about stay, stay are not a first layer, okay? These aren't like bras, these aren't like even perhaps spanks in the sense that this would touch our bodies. We're still using for both men and women, I should just stick with what I see here, for both men and women, undergarments that are incredibly important in that world. So, so in this case, the first thing that I want you to really, really, really think about is this kind of molding of the, of the female form into that upper triangle. Well, how are we going to start to get that lower triangle? And we do have a couple options there. One is a process that we have done for hundreds of years to create volume, which is put more things down at the bottom. And the term we use for a skirt that is intended to act as support or is intended to act uh, uh, to allow fullness in something is petticoat, right? We've probably heard that word before. We still use it today. This may not have been on the sheet, so I'm writing it down. So think about this word, petticoat, and how do you think it got that name? Okay. 
Is it from coat? Okay. So the, the second part isn't excellent. The idea of coat as we may wear today, but that idea of C-O-T-E. Anyone want to guess with petty? Is it many? Um, no, it's actually layer is close. It's really this idea of petit, meaning small, small, or petty, meaning half. Because in a sense, what is this petticoat? It is a skirt. And so we're starting now to think of this idea of skirts. Now, are we going to get into the land of separates? Not quite. But ultimately, we're getting into this idea of things that work on the top of the body, things that work on the bottom of the body. And we will tend to focus on a bodice and a skirt, even if they're joined together. As we thought about that, that idea of the blio and the blio leading into those gowns, that these gowns are really a certain silhouette on the top and a certain silhouette on the bottom. And those petticoat help there. They also help with warmth. They also help with, um, you know, protection in many ways. Um, and as we know, those, those support systems really keep those skirts looking pretty, one might say. So what I have done is I've brought another option. So those petticoat, soft, they're just a skirt. But if we want a very, very angled silhouette, we want a very triangle silhouette, what we can ultimately use is something like this. We're gonna see it again, so don't worry. But what we call a farthingale. And what you can see, see each of those white stripes, not the band white stripes, but each of these white things going around. Each one of these is rigid. It is filled with cane, meaning like a rattan or wicker. And what that's allowing to happen is give you a series of sequential rings helping to form out that triangle shape. And you can see that this would do the job of many, many petticoats. Think about how many sort of skirts you would need to put on to get, to get you, excuse me, into that triangle shape. But this farthingale, in this case, a conical farthingale, or sometimes called the French farthingale, would really allow some rigidity through the body. Okay. Um, let's look quick at our friends who are here. Now, I do want to make a little bit of a statement before we start this. These things are actually costumes. They are uh, costumes from a production of Anne Boleyn that I did, uh, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago um, at the GAM Theater. And so though I have tried to create these in the manner in which these clothes would be worn, they still do have some modern um, uh, closures. They do have some attention in some ways to how modern clothes need to be built. Um, there is a lot of handwork in them, but also it's, it's a little different. So we want to be careful that costume that we're seeing here represented is the way that those things would be officially made. So we do want to be really careful. And in the case of the women's clothes specifically, you know, this is a lot of clothing and they need to put it on very quickly overall. And the challenge there is, you know, these clothes weren't easy to get into. Um, and this is one of Anne's gowns here. She had eight, 10 outfits and much of the time they were incredibly quick changes. So I had to obviously accommodate with things like zippers and such. So, so please don't take the idea that you maybe see a zipper, um, that perhaps that would be um, what they used at the time, because it wasn't, obviously. <laughs> zippers weren't used in clothing until the we uh, well into the 20th century. So what I'm gonna do is bring, let's bring her forward first. And truth be told, folks, um, this is one of my favorite periods just because it's so fabulous and decorative and triumphant in so many ways. 
Um, so, and because of the way that our system is working out for the rest of the semester, we will have like two days to really focus on this stuff. However, the terms, the history, those things, those are all online. So I do like to take it a little slow so we can really eat it up because it's such good stuff. So I'm going to move you back just a little bit, just a little bit, and I'm going to tip down. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. So now you're gonna look at my torso more than actually my face, I'm sorry about that. So I'll do this, hello. So can you see the silhouette in this? Can you see the shaping um, that is being created through the bodice and the skirt? So you can respond, great, 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 great. I know sometimes you know these cameras aren't perfect, so that's a little bit difficult to fully see. But in this case, we've created as triangular of a silhouette as possible. Now it is looking as though the body stops right in here, but truly you can see that there is an angle sort of quality to the bodice as it hits into the skirt. And then we can see a relatively, sorry, one, two, three. I do that one. Or we do these shows, I always grab the front, pull it down. Uh, but we can see a relatively flat front. Can you see how the breasts or the chest are sort of pushed in to place? And we can see a very open neckline that's kind of like one part Italian Renaissance, I gotta do this, one part Gothic that sort of creates a new neck opening. And notice through the bodice also that we've started to really push out onto the shoulders. And one of the sort of misconceptions of this period is that everything is down on the shoulders, like it's a 1980s bridesmaid's dress. And we have to be really careful. It's right there on the ball of the shoulder. And that's super important because that's where the stay is sort of being placed. And once we start to take stuff off of her, we'll be able to see. Now, we can see a very strong triangularity through the bodice. And part of that is created by this dip. Can you see that point in the front? Excellent. Jordan's on it. Yep, yep. Uh, this dip in the front plays two roles. First of all, it elongates the bodice. It helps create that sense of triangularity from the shoulder being out so kind of on the ball right down into the body of the skirt. And so that's what I was mentioning, that idea of the basque, or in this case, a basque front bodice with this point, which allows for more movement all the way down. Now let's look at the skirt. Again, just focusing on silhouette. We can see a very strong triangular nature happening in there. And this is caused by a few things. Underneath this are both a petticoat and a farthingale. And you can see that it reacts because it's series of rings, it's reacting differently than if it were just series of petticoats. It would crush as opposed to this, which would sort of, I guess one could say fell a bit more. But what I want you to also notice here is this skirt, I guess you could say, and this gown. Do you notice that this gown is split down the front, right? We see that it is split, revealing a decorative underskirt. And that skirt is just the French word for skirt, which is jupe, J U. E. I'm going to type it right here. Let's see if I can get in there. It may be on the sheet, but just in case. And that jupe is a triangular or, oh, oh, sorry. That just went to an individual person. Everyone in meeting. There we go. There we go. J-U-P-E. And that's just the French word for skirt, but we use it in costume history to define when a gown is an open gown, when the skirt on it is open and is revealing something, it's showing a decorative underskirt. Now, what makes this jupe kind of tricky too in its own right? We're gonna want as expensive and as beautiful 
textiles as possible, right? So we're going to want to look as though our juke is entirely made out of this textile. However, when we spin it, oh, I may not get back up. I just want you to know, I just thought about that. I'm old. Uh, if you look, and I think there's enough of a contrast to see the front fancy textile, the rest crappy textile, just something to fill out the rest of the skirt because we're never going to see it. Why? Because the gown, the overskirt of the gown, the, the, the open part is going to cover up the rest of it. So we often see ooh, when we look at jupe in museums and things that this part is spectacular, you know, like million dollar fabric. And then the back part is whatever crap fabric they have available. So again, highly theatrical for a reason, but this, this jupe would be generally a separate piece. So you would put on all your undergarments, then you'd put on your jupe, then you'd put on your gown. For the purpose of this, even though it is a full, you know, underskirt in there, I had to sew them together just for the sake of, um, of wearability. So keep that in mind. We're going to take it off in just a minute. I want to show you the sleeves. So if you notice, I'll get to this side, the sleeve, it also emphasizes that triangularity, right? I'm trying to stand behind it so you can see a little bit better black on the blackboard. But you can see that it fit the arm very sort of tight at the beginning, but then it bells out, bells out, bells out. And we can see this very, very, very elaborate sort of cuff on the end, which is intended to look like it is folded back, because in truth, that's really what it is. But then notice inside, we have a second sleeve in which this is going to look so super creepy. You ready for this? So we have a second sleeve inside that generally coordinates with everything else, but looks to be an undergown in there. And if we really look, it's fakey fake. It's not a full gown. It's just a single sleeve that is attached inside that other sleeve. And what would it, we actually see through there? The shift. We would see the actual undergown in there. Um, but it gives the, in, the idea that there is a whole second gown under there. And we can see with this second sleeve and the jupe, they're using very you know fancy textiles for those and beading and all sorts of things and sort of tying it together to look like there's a gown on and then there's a second gown on it. So you can see those sleeves, those triangle sleeves add to the triangles. One, two, three. You could even say four there. And that's the silhouette and the shaping. Notice again, this very broad neckline and decoratively, we often see very clunky sort of jewelry jewels. I don't know what this is. I don't know what this, I'm like lunging during class. Uh, we see almost Byzantine style jewels in this very large, um, heavy, uh, you know, pieces, as well as things like pearls and such that kind of have that Byzantium floating in it. And then up here, which you kind of can see, but kind of not can see. I'm not going to put it on. I thought I'd put it on, but I'm not going to put it on. Here we can see that French hood, which is sort of semicircular shaped. And then the veil comes, you know, off the back of it. And let's take this off and here. And so what you can see is that it has sort of tabs down the side that sort of run down the face. And then it has this sort of rounded part here in which the veil would come off of. And we'll see, again, much better pictures of all of these things. OK, so let's start the strip tease here. So we're going to pretend that this is pinned. Oh, oh, this also is really important to think about. How these clothes went on the body 
are very interesting. There are lots and lots of different permutations of how they could attach. Now, if we're thinking in sort of that highly theatrical version, we want to think of laces for everything, right? But they didn't really want interrupted clothing. They wanted it to look like it was molded on the body. And some of the gowns that we know of from this period, what they would actually have was a panel that went all the way across asymmetrically and then would go into the side seam. So it would basically be like a, a flap that came over. And then remember me talking about straight pins and how important those were, then that would be pinned down the side. So the whole garment itself would look to be completely molded onto the body. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Okay. Since no one's responding. Okay, anyway, so we're going to pretend that I am removing a series of pins, that it's a series of perhaps some lacing or some hooks. And if we actually took this off, we would be left with the jupe. However, um, the jupe, as I said, is attached to the gown itself. And you can imagine how many people it would take to get somebody dressed, how important that would be. And, you know, in the case of theater, we have one person to get them dressed in like 15 seconds. So you can see how that sort of thing is put together. Now, again, notice it is a separate skirt and a bodice. It's just that the bodice in this case is joined for theatrical reasons, for quick changes. Okay, let me show you that the detail there. So you can get a sense of that kind of Byzantium detail that is happening that I tried to do, you know, by myself with like $3.45. Okay, so here we're seeing the undergarments. And still, for most of us, this is still probably feeling in a lot of ways like full on clothing, okay? But here we can see the stay which has this black edging on it, just so you can see it a little bit better. Here we're seeing a petticoat, and here we're seeing the shift. Now, do you notice that these straps for the stay tie over the shoulder and then are joined underneath? And what makes those great is when you tie them and you tighten them, it takes your shoulders and it pushes it down right? It doesn't allow your body to move. It literally pushes um, that torso into a position where your movement is somewhat restricted to what you can do. But it's also great because we can slide that as far to the edge as possible. And then in some ways, pin or even mount our gown onto that. And it makes you know, everything work out. It won't slip off the shoulders. It just is supported and sits right there. So here we're seeing a stay, very similar. We can see the busk in the front, a very rigid center section, which keeps that nice and taut. We can see the dip, the U or the rounded bask in the front. And then we can see the ties that are pulling it over the shoulder. Underneath, we're, as I said, we're seeing the shift. So we're going to untie this, which actually means unpinning. Because somebody did something that made me angry with this. Anyway, flip over, flip over, unlace. Now, where stay like to be laced is it does give you some adjustment. It does allow you to perhaps go a little bit tighter or mold your body slightly different depending on the garment and um, that you're going to be putting on and that you're going to be wearing. So let's see if I can get it open just enough. Sorry, got to collapse the shoulders. I know, isn't this glamorous? There we go. And so now you can see as well that stay and its shape. And you can see that it has that little peplum on it, that little bit of skirting, as we talked about last time, so that things sit on it, so it doesn't ride up in a lot of cases. 
So now here we can see the shift and here we can see the petticoat. Now, if you notice on the shift, could be pretty hard for me to bring this forward. You should be able to see a little bit of red stitching on that. Okay, and that was very popular for undergarments. And we're gonna see it also on the men's clothes as well, this idea of work. So in this case, because it's red stitching, we would call it red work. And then when we get to the gentleman's clothes, we're gonna to get to what we call black work. And it's just decorating or uh, embroidering your garment with a little bit of detail to make it pretty. Yes, it's, but it's W-O-R-K. Uh, but yes, work. So here we see a shift. And the big idea of this shift is it is just a big triangle of fabric that doesn't have much shaping through the body or any sort of movement. And often it as well has a very broad neck. So here we can see the petty coat, this half coat or this small coat. Yeah. She's not working with me today. There we go, there we go, there we go. And we can see that in this case, it is just a piece of cloth with some fullness in it. And you could wear multiples of these on top of each other. And even in the winter, you know, you'd put those on because it would keep you warmer. And here now, there we go. We can see kind of the most base element. So here we can see the what? Farthingale. Farthingale, thank you. <laughs> um, and the shift itself and how this would actually work. You know, some people call this hoops and I don't like the term hoops. Hoops is a very different thing. Um, so I'd like to be careful of it, but it would often be slightly adjustable as well. And you can see that it sort of, that it sort of opens up on each side to help balance it from place to place. But it gives a rigid sense to that and supports all those layers of skirting, you know, or gives the skirting structure, as I like to say. Finally on her, I've added one more piece and it's a pad, a pad around the body that helps sort of move the skirt off of the body. And this is one of those terms that it seems like everybody knows in one way or another. Anybody know what that's called? No, that's yeah. the bum roll. <laughs> the bum roll, correct. What does it do? It's, it, it just adds a little bit of padding through the, the back part and the side part of the body so that the skirt moves off a little bit easier. And we'll see this more so when we get to Elizabethan, but we know that it's under there, okay? Now, one of the terms that was on the list, I know very well, because I remember it, was this idea of bombast. And what is bombast? It's stuffing things with things to give them volume. So, you know, that idea of one might say, all of a sudden my computer's not charging and that makes me nervous. There we go. Uh, somebody is filled with bombast, that means they're filled with stuffing. And what would that stuffing be? Well, the Victorian word for it is cabbage, which means it's scraps of fabric. So imagine you're cutting a garment, you're gonna have little scraps of fabric that you can sort of toss up and then stuff in. But bombast also in anything, throughout history that you need to create volume could be anything. It could be bran, like the holes off of things that are dried out and stuffed in. It could be, you know, like um, not pebbles per se, but just bits of organic material that you'd find. It could be, you know, a dead rat if you want to put a dead rat in there. Anything to, to help create volume in that. So that's what bombast is. And the bum roll is, in a sense, stuffed with bombast, okay? And I'm not gonna take off the farthingale, but you can see the shift. I'm gonna pull it out, pull it out, pull it out, pull it out, pull it out. Again, this shift is highly theatrical, it has Velcro on it. We're not gonna talk about it. it, makes me crazy. 
There we go. So we could see it is just a smock, a very large sort of triangular garment that would cover the body, could be laundered, um, and is kind of shape-wise unimportant. Velcro, hate Velcro. Sometimes it's a necessity. Okay, so does this kind of make sense? These different layers for right now. <laughs> yes, Rat Tattooey, the musical, the Rat School or Rat Musical or whatever it's called. Anyway, okay, let's move on to Henry. Let's get Henry naked. Okay, so this is the silhouette of this period. Can you see how it's very boxy, very tree-like? Because we imagine that all these gowns, these pieces that are on our body sort of end at a certain point, and then we see legs. Because again, with Henry being such a big guy, those Italian Renaissance styles that felt so much more lyrical and more open didn't really suit him as well as one might want to wear. And we see that he emphasizes, or the court, or you know, the people that we see of this period emphasize the broadness of it all. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is this sort of over coat, this huge, huge cloak that we call the Shamer. Okay. And what you can see is the idea of it really does come from all those robes, all those gown that we saw in hey, hey, other periods with the stand collar, rectangular, closing up. Now it just looks like a surcoat. But this collar now is cut so large that it allows it to open up and create these things that we might call lapels, but the historical word for them is reveres, you know, that it opens it up. But do you see how opening that up creates broadness across the shoulder and then those triangles coming down sort of focus the body to look slightly different than it really was. The next part of the Shamer is that it has these very large sleeves. Now, if you notice, they're half sleeves, okay? They're just rounded, full half sleeves. And then finally, the gown itself, the robe itself of the Shamer, is just a big volume of clothing, okay? There's nothing special about it, just full. So when we take this off, and if I was to put it on, I feel more comfortable putting on men's clothes often, but, um, oh, I wore the red colored sweater too for that. Look at that. But you can see it, it builds out the silhouette quite a bit, right? And creates volume. And we see in this a lot of the things that we sort of recognize from fairy tales and such. Okay, so that's the Shamer. And we're gonna come back, sorry, I thought, <laughs> I'm like, and then we're going to come, no, we're going to come back to something that is on the sleeves that is super important there. So this is what we're left with, with our base layers, okay? And we get a sense of the body in this. However, Henry is using some stuff that he knew from previous and some stuff that found its way to England that is specifically Italian Renaissance. And if you notice, this garment has a skirt. So what garment, and I'm going to give you another little trick here. Can you see that it's just a, a vest almost or a torso covering that then has a skirt attached to it? What was that? What was that called? Yeah, the guard's dress. But what was that certain garment called? I told Bases. You we Bases, excellent. We can see that he's using 
that sort of skirting of the bases in his clothing. Now, once the Shemer, when we look at those pictures, once the Shemer and such go over it, it's really hard to see. But we know ultimately that lots of layers are happening underneath all of this stuff. So I'm going to bring this to you a little bit so you can see maybe a little bit better. The torso, I know, awkward. But can you see that here we have a body covering that covers the entire your body with then sleeves and then through here we can see very carefully a sort of suspension layer that when we even turn it towards the back you could see that it is worn vest like right so then from there it's just joined touches base at the waist so when we take that off what do we think we're going to see underneath any guesses? Five, four, three, two, one. Nah, okay. Underneath. Does this look familiar to any of the things we saw? Right? When we looked at Italian Renaissance, we saw that idea of the poor point slowly verging into the padlock. And notice that this upper part, these bases kind of have a little padlockiness to them. But ultimately, it is just a torso covering, heavyweight. So it's not a shirt, but a torso covering that stops at the waist and then in this case has a peplum. So this is where we really, really, really start to sort of give up how it's cut and what it's cut. So poor point and, and padlock, all those go away. And now we're going to use the word doublet for this garment, okay? So think of this garment, what makes it a doublet? It's a torso covering, perhaps one could say bodice with sleeves and often it will have some sort of peplum on it. Now, I'm gonna back, let's back his booty up. Beep, 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 beep. So what are we seeing here? Kamika. Right, we're seeing the Kamika there. But what's interesting is because of these bases and because of the Shamer, we don't know what's fully going on under there, but we can make an assumption. We can make an assumption that eventually this idea of breaches or bifurcated garments are gonna find their way into that world where they take their hose, or as we call it in this period, stocks, and they break those stocks into two pieces. So we have our lower stocks, which actually come up to the knee or above that we would call lower stocks, hosiery. And then we have the upper stocks, which find themselves eventually into this idea of breaches. So he has breaches, he had breaches with this costume, but we would never see them because the skirting of the bases and the fullness of the um, shamer would cover a great deal of it. Now, the one thing this costume doesn't have, and again, that was because of this production, is the one piece that really is uncomfortable in this period, which is the cod piece. Now, if we think about these pieces, if you notice, they're all kind of split down the center because the cod piece that became popular was a three-dimensional, almost pillow-like, cod piece. And for the case of this production, um, the directors felt that it would be a bit um, unnerving, which is kind of the point of it all, but uh, to, to actually see cod pieces. And this is kind of its last hurrah. We see it in this period and then in the next period, they start to disappear altogether. But um, what we would definitely see from the underside would be the cod piece, which would be in this place. So underneath all of this, as we know, because we pointed it out, 
would be the idea of the Kamika. And oh, one other quick thing. There is also a very fancy quality to these clothes. Like when we tend to think of a hyper masculine, one might even say a toxic masculine personality, we don't think of jewels and embroidery and decoration perhaps in the very same way. But when we look at Henry's garments, we're gonna see tons and tons of jewels and embroideries and detail, but also notice that they are very uh, uh, Byzantine in some way. Now, last thing before I completely take it off. Do we notice the Kamika popping out here? We can see the collar of the doublet, and then we can see that little bit starting to pop up of the Kamika underneath that doublet. And if you notice, there's a, it's kind of hard to see because you're so far away, but there's a little bit of ruffle on the edge. And this ruffle we call the phrase. And I think it's on your sheet, but I'm just gonna type it in there. But that phrase is that little bit of white that pokes out. It's starting to give way or become the predecessor to this sort of thing, right? The collar on the shirt that we see either jet out or fold down. So that's an important sort of uh, little detail for us to remember, so that idea of the phrase. But when we take off this doublet and we take off these bases, and again, those wouldn't be joined, they would be two separate pieces. We're left with the Kamika, right? And we can see this Kamika has black stitching, so we would call this Kamika, the decoration on this. Black work. Black work, excellent. And you can see all these bits of black work on that to add, you know, to elevate it a bit. Now, one of the things to remember about shirts, even for the kings and such, wives would make shirts and the queens would make shirts for Henry VIII. So this would be their work. They wouldn't just send it to a tailor because it was the closest, uh, closest thing to your body. So it was sort of touching your heart as well. So we know that the queens themselves, all 300 of them, no, they're actually only six, um, would have made those shirts. So the skills and the intricacy that we see in those would be of, you know, his wives or the wives of, of anyone. Okay, so do those layers help make sense of it a little bit? Yep. Excellent, excellent. Two other quick things I want to talk about, because we're going to see them in the, uh, some of the illustrations we're going to look at. We have about 15 minutes to go through one of the slideshows, so that's great. But I want to talk about the idea of the pomander. Has anybody ever heard the word pomander before? Nope. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> okay, some people have, especially around the holidays, we talk about pomanders and, and the easiest pomander that is made, and it, is, it doesn't have to be for the holidays, but it's kind of a winter solstice sort of idea, is you would take an orange and then you put cloves in it. You know, you stick cloves all the way around and it makes this sort of fragrant ball. But what the pomander really is, is this. I'm gonna YouTube it. I'm gonna YouTube it by putting my hand behind. It looks like a Christmas ornament, right? Which is actually what it is, but it's a perfect pomander. Because what you would do is you would open it up and it's not a pokeball, so don't even think that. But <laughs> is that what they're called, pokeballs or something like that? I don't know, I don't know, beyond, beyond my age. But you would fill it with potpourri, you would fill it with um, fragrant, things, right? Just pop it in there and then you would close it up and then lock it. And then you would put it on a belt and this was primarily for women, but you would put it on a belt and suspend it down at the bottom of your dress. So it sometimes was in front, sometimes it was between the layers. And then what would happen when you walked? What would, what would be the, yeah, it does look like a tea thing, but what would happen if, as you walked and you moved your skirt? No, get a little wouldn't. puff of stinky, but good stuff. Right, you get aromatic <laughs> scents all around you and that activity that, oh no, it's not, it's, it's pretty lightweight.
but the idea of it is it would it would um, keep fragrance in the air because you have to imagine these are you know they can't go to the dry cleaners they can't just take these things out you would pretty much just air them out um, and that's why those undergarments would be so important and then finally another so this one I feel pretty comfortable putting on the the clothes themselves do sort of adapt let's get it in place here and we start to lose the sense of you know some things having names but you can notice that this is shimmer like in some ways but it's also bases like but it's also kind of doublet like we start to mix and match all of these pieces so this would be probably worn over a doublet. It's obviously not bases, right? Because it's, so we can sort of mix and match all these things to sort of become their own shapes and silhouettes. And notice somebody, this is what happens is I get the clothes again. And then I realize that somebody has messed with them. They're not the thing that I, how I love them. But in this case, you know, it's really this idea of asymmetricality, very similar to what we were talking about with the bodices and such. So there we go. Okay. So those are the big, big ideas of all of this. Helping you as we get to these pictures that we're going to be looking at in a couple seconds here, helping us understand what is um, behind all of these clothes. That was not the one I wanted to do. Let's try another one. I'm going to stop share. I'm going to go back. This is the one I want to do. And it keeps bringing that one up. What happens if I do that? Okay, there we go. Because it was hiding behind. Okay. So, so I can't see comments right now because of the way that this whole thing screen share. Oh, wait, I can do, can I do this? You get to look at my calendar. Isn't that exciting? Come on. No, nope, won't let me, won't let me move to that. But okay, so here we are. I'm just gonna do it this way. I know it's not it's not the best view of my nose, but here we are with Henry. This is young Henry. And um, when he was young, he was considered to be dashing and sporty, and he was actually second in line to the throne, but unfortunately his brother Arthur, who was first in line to the throne, died. And he was married to Catherine of Aragon, uh, meaning Arthur was. And so after Catherine, or after Arthur died, um, Catherine of Aragon was then married off to Henry. So let's do this one, just so I can see the whole big picture. And let me move, anyway. Uh, so here we see Henry and we get a sense of what he looked like as a young boy and, or a young man. And we can see a couple of things going on. If you look at the body of this, can you see these sort of Italian Renaissance doublet going on there? And then notice this sort of open neck, this, this full neck. No, no, I gotta do this one more time. Sorry, folks, this is, my face is on top of Henry right now, and it's making me crazy. Escape, escape, escape. Oh, uh, okay, well, is, uh, is your view blocking, or is my face blocking the view? No. You have control of that. Okay, no. I just wanna make sure. Sometimes Zoom does crazy things for me, so. But this is not how we think of Henry, right? We don't think of Henry as this, thin, tiny thing, what we ultimately think of is this, right? We think of this full bodied figure. And can you see how the clothes really are exaggerating the silhouette? If we look, we see, I'm moving back to this so that we can use this mouse at least. We can see the fullness of the sleeves and the shimmer. The thing that I made is like, a quarter of the size of these. This is so theatrical, you can barely put it on stage, but you can see those very, very full half sleeves. We can see that revere. 
that very full folded over collar that is happening. Here, we can see the body. I'm gonna bring this in just a little bit. And we can see the torso covered in what we would think of as a doublet. But can you see the sneaky, sneaky, sneaky bases riding just on top of that? So if you look at it quickly, it looks like the bodice, or the, in this case, doublet, has this skirting on it. But what we really see is that there's a set of bases that are the skirted part worn over the doublet. And slowly as we work our way down, we can't help but notice that, right? Crazy, insane. So, I mean, it's, it's literally like a hand puppet popping out, but it plays to this idea of sexuality. It plays to this idea of virility that Henry thought was so important. Um, we can see tons and tons of jewels and tons and tons of decorations. Notice the, the you know, buttons, I guess you could call them going down the front. We see the buttons down each sleeve. We see this very broad, what we call a chain of office, which sort of informs us a little bit about his sense. And it's pretty decorated, right? I mean, we see all of this embroidery and we see that these textiles are very, very, um, embroidered and I guess you could say fancy. Now, look at the sleeves though. So this is the sleeve of the doublet, right? So it's the doublet, the doublet sleeve, the bases, no sleeve, and then the chimere. But notice that that looks as though the sleeve itself is made up out of individual strips of fabric that are then pinned together. And that's that's a term we're going to use again that's called panes, P-A-N-E-S, like panes of a window, pieces that come together. And we can see how they're using that idea by creating, again, a visual movement down, but then notice bits of the shirt are pulled through. So when we looked at the segmented sleeves in Italian Renaissance, right, we saw that sort of emphasis on the kamika underneath. Here we're doing it where our body is covered but we're pulling it through. And even if we look at the doublet, can you see how there are tiny little cuts in here? So again, what it is, is it's slashed or cut, and then the shirt is pulled through. We call it puffing. Look up around the neck here. It's a little blurry, but you can see very clearly that phrase, that Kamika collar that is coming up. Now, because he has a little bit more fullness of face, you know, it's sort of flopping down, but that is ultimately going to become stuff that we understand in time. And then when we look at the rest of him, we can see that, you know, the, the skirt of the bases sort of ends just at the knee. And then what are we seeing here? The hose, or as we can call them, lower stocks. What's happening underneath here is impossible to see. We'll never fully know we're pretty sure that there was something bifurcated under there. And then we can see these shoes. So we'll get into specifics next time of like individual things, but I want you to understand silhouettes and garments, okay? So let's go next. Ah, shut up, there we go. We're just gonna look quickly through um, the queens, just to get a sense of all the difference in them, okay? So here we see first Catherine of Aragon. And notice, just like that triangular dress that I was showing um, behind me, you can see that the torso is very controlled. You can see that it's sitting ever so slightly. I keep doing that and then it doesn't work. So we gotta stay here. You can see that that, that bodice opening is very angled off of the shoulders and straight across. And you can imagine how this might be pulled to one side and then pinned in place down one side. If we look super carefully right here, you can see the shift underneath with a little bit of red work. No, nope, that's not red work, sorry. No, it is, it's a little bit of black work on it. And then notice the jewels around the neckline, around this trapezoidal neckline, very Byzantium, right? It looks like we're, we're right back there to Justinian. 
Now, on her head, we see the gabled headdress. And this was made, again, very rigid. And we call it gabled because it is like a root. And it has the hang down over the face. But then part of it is folded back up. And then from the back, we see the hood. Now, what is interesting to me, at least in this period, if you ever have a standard pack of cards floating around in your life, the illustrations from those cards, Queen of Hearts, King of Hearts, all those people, you're going to see Tudor clothing. It's all sort of referencing these clothes that we're seeing here. And so in turn, one could even look at this and the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, and we see very similar Tudor lines in her as well. We can see that triangular sleeve folded back, folded up to reveal the undersleeve, allowing us to then see the, um, the shift or the Kamika popping out at the edge there. Okay, so that's Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, who he was married to for quite a long time, surprisingly. Next was Anne Boleyn, and we see very similar things in this portrait, but I want you to look specifically at the headdress. There we're seeing that French hood, which is much more circular, much more framing of the face, and we can see that it is detailed all the way around, has little tabs here, very similar to the one I had that would then tie under the chin, and then from behind, we can see the veil that would be covering the hair, and then here we can see um, a little bit of black work around the edge, and we can also see the chains. How do you know that's Anne Boleyn? Aside from Anna Boleyn written at the top, um, you can also see her necklace. There are only a few illustrations, but this is the most famous with that B with the three pearls hanging off of it. And of a thousand days, she was eventually beheaded. Next, we have Jane Seymour. And this is a beautiful painting for us to see all these things happening at once. Again, notice the bodice so far off the shoulder. It's not again though, like that bridesmaids off the shoulder. It's really on the bone of the shoulder. And then notice how smooth that whole torso bodice is here. That makes you, if we look, uh, uh, come on, get bigger, get bigger. Oh my goodness, there we go. Can you see it? If you look, Right here, you can see that it is a flap that folds over and then pins are holding it down on the body. Isn't that so cool? I love that. Anyway, we can see around her waist, she's wearing a beaded or a jeweled belt, which then if we look down here, we could see it's leading to something. And what that is, is probably a pomander down at the bottom. We can cancel, I don't wanna do that. We can see how fit the sleeve is. And then we can see that that over sleeve is folded back up to the shoulder. And then we can see that decorative under sleeve there with sort of the pulling of the, of the shift or the Kamika out. And we see these beautiful black work cuffs. The gown itself is open, right? It's an open gown showing us the jupe underneath. And notice that the jupe matches the sleeves. So Jane Seymour died in childbirth with the only male heir for Henry VIII. Next, we have Anne of Cleves. And Anne looks very different, partially because she is not from England and is uh, from the sort of lowlands. The, um, and her style is much more, I, I hasten to use the word eccentric, but feels very different than these very classic Tudor lines that we see. Um, but you can see that there's a bit of an influence from that Gothic era, right? With that sort of higher waistline. We see some fullness going on here, but then that leads into that sort of traditional Tudor sleeve. And then we can see that it has a band collar. And then her headdress, very interesting, feels more Gothic, right? And that's what we tend to see in sort of um, the mid in Cleves and Germany and such is kind of a holding on to some of those more um, gothic styles. But look at that headdress. You know, it's sort of kind of one part gabled headdress and then one part kind of crispinette. We gotta move through, we gotta move through. Catherine of Aragon, or uh, sorry, Catherine Howard. You'd think I'd remember her last name. Catherine was um, very, very young when she married Henry. And this painting isn't really much 
to look at, but we can still see the French hood. We can see the gown, but worn in a very, very different way. And then finally, we see Catherine Parr, um, who did survive him. And we can see that her style of clothing is almost very masculine, right? It has the fullness of the sleeves that are very similar to the Chamere. We see that kind of phrase collar going on there. And we can even see that her headdress isn't so much the headdresses like we saw before, the gable or the um, French headdress, but it almost feels like Henry's cap his beret that we see here on top of a woman, uh, of a coif or such, okay? So that's where we are. That is, what is that gonna do with that? There we go, awesome. Um, so that's the introduction to the tutor, okay? If you didn't get a chance to yet, please read um, the section on tutor because there are so many terms and there's so many little tidbits that make it so, so much more interesting. Maybe to me, maybe not for you. But um, on Tuesday from a week from today, we will um, go through more slides, look at lots more pictures, which is exciting, and sort of hopefully finish out tutors. So bring questions, be active, have fun, um, and be prepared for next Tuesday. But biggest picture, have a great Thanksgiving break. Please be careful. Please stay safe. Um, you know, we want to make sure that that uh, that you stay healthy and such. Okay. So I see poppers. I see a popper.